Well, I know today's going to be a good show because Jamie is lit up like a Christmas tree. He is so excited. I, Jamie is like... Uh, it's, it's like a kid on Christmas. You're so excited for today's show. It was Ryan Wilson's. I really think that Ryan Wilson is is your best friend. That's kind of what I get. Or you I, want you know, him to be your best friend. I do want him to be my best friend. I, I love Ryan to death. I think he's fantastic at what he does. I, I think I've said this time and time again. If you listen to FFT and five, Ryan, we do uh, our five minute podcast uh, Sunday night for Monday. I was saying how everybody should listen to the show because you are the best at what you do. And, uh, but really I like talking to Ryan about like parenting stuff because, um, he has two boys. They're older than my three boys. And I like hearing his stories because I know what to expect, but, um, I I have a a parenting story to share with Ryan, but I'll let you introduce Ryan first before we get into the parenting stuff. Okay. I'm trying to come up with some new nicknames for Ryan. Uh, he covers the NFL draft for CBS sports. I've got Mr. Mock draft, mock man, (laughs) back draft, like little kind of old pop culture reference draft punk. Draft like Daft Punk. <laughs> I like uh, it. Yeah. So I just came up with those. I'll try to figure out some more by the end of the show. Ryan, uh, you have you done a mock draft since the one we talked about on FFT and five, the seven rounder? Yeah, I came out Monday morning, a three rounder. Uh, you know, we're in NFL draft week, the actual draft week. So that came out Monday, and then I'll have one more on Thursday morning where I just copy everything, Jason and, and Pete and whoever <laughs> else might know what they're doing. I, I put that in there and put my name on it. But um yeah, no, I love this. is one of my favorite times of year. And I need to talk to Jamie once a, once a month, at least for my mental health, because he makes me so, feel so good about myself that uh, <laughs> another reason I love coming on here. Yeah, just listen to our podcast. You'll feel great about yourself. Jamie, uh, Jamie speaks very highly of you. You do a great job. We're looking forward to uh, breaking down your latest mock draft. Uh, we just I'll just run through the news and notes. We won't even talk about them. But Cleveland exercise fifth year options on Baker Mayfield and Denzel Ward. The big news over the weekend was Kansas City acquiring left tackle Orlando Brown from the Baltimore Ravens. They also got a second round pick in 2022 and a sixth round pick. Uh, they're giving up a first round pick, a third round pick, a fourth round pick this year, and a 2022 fifth round pick. So the Chiefs gave up a lot. They give up their first rounder, but they get Orlando Brown. That's a big deal and really makes you sleep better at night if you have Patrick Mahomes and all those guys in your dynasty leagues. Carolina considering trading back. Detroit trading back, maybe. They're at eight and seven, respectively. I'm going to ask Ryan who he thinks uh, will trade back. In fact, uh, I have NFL draft fill in the blank. And we'll do that in a moment. Let me ask you, though, just, you know, in general, if you were going to sum up the draft in just a few sentences, people are, you know, great at wide receiver, great at cornerback, whatever it is, sum up the 2021 NFL draft. Yeah, the wide receiver class is actually going to be pretty deep. Not quite as deep as last year, but that's a great place to start. Uh, there'll be some interesting running backs that that probably go on day three, but that can help you, I feel like, it, from a fantasy fantasy perspective. And, of course, the, the conversation will always be about the quarterbacks. There'll be five quarterbacks for certain that go in round one. We'll see if a sixth one slips in there, which I think would be sort of silly, even by NFL draft standards. But, uh, again, it could happen because of the fifth-year option. Uh, but in terms of offensive players, uh, I think that there's a lot of guys to like, especially the skill position. If your team needs an offensive tackle, they can probably find that guy in, in the first three rounds as well. And um, I don't know if you care much about defense. Oh, but, yeah. Um, yeah, we do. This is not just going to be a fantasy discussion today. It'll be largely a fantasy discussion. Jamie, by the way, uh, I think his power just went out, so he'll be back very shortly. Ryan, you're stuck with me for a little bit. Um, but yeah, oh, what, is, it, is it a bad defensive draft? No, it's not. Cornerback will be fun. There'll be some guys there in, in the first few rounds that can help your team. Edge rusher is interesting that you won't get a guy that probably goes, you know, your guy, Dave Gettleman, might take someone at 11 that's slightly overdrafted. <laughs> but if they if they start going 15 to 30, that feels like the range when those guys will off the board. And, and again, like a team like the Titans need edge rush help. That would make some sense there. The Steelers, perhaps at the bottom of round one. Uh, the defensive line class is incredibly shallow. That That is a concern. But um, linebacker, off-ball linebacker, which we typically don't talk about a lot in, in round one, we're sort of moving towards those guys being more valuable. And we could see two or three guys go in the first round, but certainly a handful of guys in the first two days. And, and the same with safety. Safety is a, a, a sort of a fun position where we're seeing more hybrid-type players based on the Isaiah Simmons of the world. And, and there will be depth at those positions as well. And I feel like for the edge rushers, yeah, it might take a little longer than usual to see them come off the board. But how many could go in the first round? Because, you know, I feel like it could be quite a bit in the first round, just not until maybe 15 or later. Yeah, that's right. So I'm looking here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys that are potential first round grades. And I think probably five and a half is the over under where things get interesting. So Quiddy Pay, uh, Azizo Jalari, uh, Jason Owe could be in the mix out of Penn State, Carlos Basham. 
Jalen Phillips is a guy that we've all been hearing about forever at Miami uh, after the 2020 season. That there are injury medical concerns there, so if he clears those, uh, he's definitely a first-round talent, potentially the best edge rusher in this class if he can stay healthy. And then finally, I mentioned Joe Tryon out of Washington who opted out. But again, an, uh, another one of these quote-unquote high upside guys who could evolve into the edge rusher in, in a year or two, uh, even though he hasn't played a ton of football. Uh, well, the NFL draft is here, and the Fantasy Football Today crew is going to be live for all three days of the draft, breaking down the fantasy impact of the picks. So join Jamie, Dave, Heath, NFL analysts like Pete Prisco, and of course, Ryan Wilson, and former players like Brady Quinn and Bryant McFadden on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday on the Fantasy Football Today YouTube channel. This is how you're going to watch. You're going to go to youtube.com slash Today. Get your questions answered in the chat room and start your 2021 fantasy prep early. And remember, everything is live. YouTube.com slash fantasy football today. We're giving away a spot in the 2021 listeners podcast league. That's uh, on our Facebook page. We got a lot of great draft coverage this week and great opportunities. So go to our Facebook page for that. Uh, just just uh, search on Facebook, Fantasy Football Today, or click the link in the episode description. It's going to take you directly to my post. Comment on there with your prediction of the top 10 picks of the NFL draft, and whoever is closest to the exact order gets the spot. You'll see the instructions right there. But again, if you want to be in the podcast league, click the link in the episode description or go to the Facebook group. And if you want to watch our coverage, youtube.com slash Fantasy Football Today. We'll do some NFL draft fill in the blank. Here we go. Blank is the best wide receiver in this class. I think it's Jamar Chase. I mean, I know it's Jamar Chase. <laughs> He's my wide receiver number one. And I, I, the only thing I will say, Azer, is this. If Devontae Smith didn't weigh 166 pounds but weighed 186 pounds, he would be my wide receiver one. And I'm only concerned about him because NFL teams are concerned about him. I think he's going to be a great NFL player. Uh, we saw that week in and week out in, in Alabama where he was just dominating guys who were going to be first, second, third round picks. But Jamar Chase for me right now, and forever uh, okay. through the draft process and, will be wide receiver one. And that's where we're at with Devontae Smith at 100, he's 166 pounds? That's what he weighed a few days ago. That's uh, right. So he's six feet, 166 pounds. Man, that is light. Uh, okay, then. Jamar Chase is the best wide receiver prospect since blank. My knee-jerk reaction when I was reading this was Justin Jefferson, <laughs> his teammate at LSU and who came on the scene last year as the 22nd pick. I think he was a fourth or fifth wide receiver taken, which goes to just reinforces that it's so hard to predict how these guys are going to turn out. Justin yeah, but Jefferson was he really that big of a prospect because Lamb and no. Ra- right, right. He was. I My reaction was, is he really? OK, is Jamar Chase the best wide receiver prospect since maybe Julio Jones? That's what I that's what I eventually scribbled. OK. Down. Because my knee jerk was, well, is he going to be better than Justin Jefferson in year one? I don't know. But right, uh, it's uh, Julio Jones feels like the, the the comp in terms of being able to dominate. Like I, when I talk about Jamar Chase, the, the comp I say is Anquan Bolden, but fast in terms of being physical. Uh, he creates more separation, but he's not getting wide open like Justin Jefferson did last year. But he can. But yeah, yeah I think Julio Jones is where I landed. Julio Jones, 959 yards, eight touchdowns in 13 games as a rookie all the way back in 2011. And Anquan Bolden, by the way, before Justin Jefferson had the best, you know, arguably the best rookie season ever for a wide receiver. So hopefully uh, these guys can can really contribute. And you mentioned Justin Jefferson. Do you see Justin Jefferson in Terrace Marshall? No. No. Uh, and here's, that's a good question. Terrace is bigger, and Terrace actually ran faster at his pro day. My concern with Terrace Marshall, and our Jason Lockenford mentioned this, there might be some injury concerns. Jason talked to Terrace's agent who said nothing beyond the wear and tear of playing football, but NFL teams maybe have some issues with him as a possible bottom of the first round guy, so I mentioned that. But Terrace Marshall had his was at his most successful in 2019 as the third fiddle behind Chase and Jefferson. So I don't know if he can dominate as a number one, and if you're taking him in the first round, that would be my concern. That doesn't mean he can't be great or he won't be great. Just I feel... I'd feel more comfortable taking him maybe around later. But that's a good question and a fair question to ask because we didn't know that Justin Jefferson was going to be as good as he was because he also was sort of in Jamar's shadow. Yeah, I just look at like the size and the speed combination and the fact that, correct me if I'm wrong here, but Terrace Marshall out of LSU can play both inside and outside just like Justin Jefferson. And he's a little bit different. You know, After you get past those top three, the consensus top three, I guess we could say, you got a lot of small guys uh, a lot of jet sweep guys, a lot of players. He could be really good, but slot receivers, and he's he's just different. Uh, and Jefferson 
really had this surprisingly amazing 1,400-yard rookie season. Uh, so I, I just saw maybe physical comparisons uh, between the two and uh, that he stands out, that Marshall stands out a little bit in this wide receiver class, which is kind of a small class, small in terms yeah. of height, in terms of height. Right. That's a that's a great point in terms of the the smallish nature of some of the guys who could in, eventually go off the board, the Elijah Moores, the Rondell Moores, even the Kadarius Tonys. Um, and Terrence Marshall did play inside it out at LSU. Uh, he just wasn't the the first the first option, and that wasn't his fault. He played with two first round picks. That's what's going to happen. So uh, I think it's a fair point. And a, and a team like the Ravens makes some sense at the bottom of the first round because they don't need another Marquise Brown. They need a, a big target who can get open. Miles Boykin hasn't uh, put it all together yet. And, and Terrace Marshall doesn't. I mean, that makes sense there as well to, in terms of the guy you described and what teams may be looking yeah. for. Well, I've fallen in love with Terrace Marshall, so I do not okay. I do not want him to go to the Ravens. That is the worst destination <laughs> for the lowest pass volume team. Uh, I don't know. Is there, Jamie, is there a worse destination than the Ravens for a wide receiver? Jamie, you got me? Yeah. Is there a worse destination than the Ravens? For a, for a wide, wide receiver? For a wide receiver, yeah. Uh, maybe New England? Yeah, that wouldn't be good either. Yeah. Good point. Okay, uh, let's go back to fill in the blank. Jamie, f- please feel free to participate. Blank is the best running back in this class. Ryan muted. Up. Ryan's muted. Sorry. There he is. I had to. I had to cough. Brinson tells me <laughs> hell of a show today, huh? <laughs> Brinson tells me at least I'm bringing the Will Brinson energy. He tells me once a week to please unmute myself as the old person because I forget. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm going with Najee Harris. He's my he's been my favorite running back for quite some time. I know folks are partial to Travis Eighteen, and I certainly understand that Tra- Najee's a little older, um, but I I think he is almost as dynamic. Uh, I think he's a slightly tougher runner, and um, that's the guy. I, I like it. If he ended up going 24 to the Steelers, my my homer team, I wouldn't hate it if, if some other things don't fall into place for them when they pick at the bottom of round one. I totally agree. agree. Not Harris. Uh, I blank running backs are selected in the first first round. So William Hill has one and a half, and that's probably the, the great number. So if the Dolphins take a running back at 18, do the Steelers come back and take one at 24? Would the Buccaneers take one at 32? The, those are the – would the Bills think about taking one at 30? I'll go over. I think it's going to be two running backs, but I don't feel great about that. I would take under. I think it's just going to be one. I think it's going to be Harris. Um, I think the surprise would be, though, if he slips to the Steelers. And like you said, you know, I wouldn't also rule out, you know, not only the teams you mentioned behind them, but maybe the, the Jets as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you, well, let me check your latest draft. I remember the one from Friday. <laughs> I know the way you uh, you had it was the Steelers took uh, took Javante Williams or okay well right now you have the Falcons taking Javante Williams this is your latest one from this morning right yeah at thirty five and so you have the Jaguars taking ETN at thirty three and so you have Najee Harris I'm sorry this is the first time I'm looking at it actually so it is Monday morning. Uh, Najee Harris to the Dolphins at eighteen. Okay, you got it. So Dolphins, See, Ryan, get him. unlike the podcast you're usually on. Our host is typically prepared, so this is this is catching him off guard. Uh, Jamie, I will tell you this: I did the uh, the five the the five minute podcast you guys do last week with yeah. Adam, and I have I've never had a five minute conversation with Princeton, much less done anything resembling <laughs> a podcast. If I, it was it was so refreshing, and uh, I very truly appreciated it. You mean the host didn't go? Uh, so what are you talking about? Ooh, I don't even know what today is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anyway, Harris, 18 to the Dolphins, ETN, 33rd to the Jaguars, Javante Williams, 35th to the Falcons. Jamie, if that were to play out that way, and you had Harris to the Dolphins, ETN to the Jaguars, Javante Williams to the Falcons, how would you rank them in fantasy? Harris easily would be number one. Um, Williams would probably be number two, just given the opportunity to play in Atlanta's system and probably get the better chance to start. ETN, I think, would actually overtake James Robinson probably by the middle of the season, if not sooner. But uh, that would be something you'd have to keep an eye on, just, I I think, looking at all the scenarios. But, you know, Williams would be in a great situation with the Falcons, and obviously Harris would be the best of that trio. Ryan, give me the scouting report on Javante Williams. So he's he's a physical guy, right? Likes to hit people, (laughs) run into people. Uh, I know that's why Emory Hunt doesn't really like him that much. He doesn't like that he runs the contact. He's not. I think 
think Embry said he's not sure that's going to translate at the next level. And the other thing I want to know is I'm worried from a fantasy perspective about Williams that he's kind of like what we saw from Kenyon Drake maybe in 2020 where he wouldn't be used in the passing game, where he might be kind of a touchdown dependent guy. And may, look, maybe he's amazing and he's Derrick Henry or something. But I don't. I, tell me what you think about his versatility. I guess, um, and how much do you like him? I like him a lot. I think he weighed like two twenty. He weighed about two hundred pounds more than Michael Carter, the other running back in that system. And you're a you guy, right, Azer? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, they absolutely destroyed <laughs> yeah, why, that, that game. Is it every time yes, we talk about these guys, we yes. talk about that game. But the thing is, like, there's yeah, no, you, you can't explain what happened. You had Roche, you had Jalen Phillips, you have uh, Bubba, what's Bubba's last name? Bubba the, Bolden, defense, yeah. Bubba Bolden Bubba in the back is really good, and they just got steamrolled. And the thing about, like, Javante Williams, I think Bubba he catch passes. He and Michael Carter both had about the same number of receptions, like in the 20s, 25. I think. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so they're capable of doing that. And just sometimes in, in those college offenses, you're not asked to do it a lot. I, I think he does, you know, Pete Prisco jokes that Leonard Fournette runs to contact. I don't feel like that's Javante Williams. I just feel like he's such a big bruising back that he runs through people. He's not looking to run around them. Uh, but he has that ability in open field to make guys miss. Uh, and, you know, we've heard sort of conversations. And if you look at the William Hill odds, I think it's plus 450 that he's the first wide uh, running back taken. I don't think he's going to be the first. But I do know that teams at the bottom of the first round like him. And, and I think he, like, if he went to Pittsburgh, for example, I, I would love the idea of, of him being there and have no concerns about uh, some of the things that Emory, Emory mentioned. That said, Emory was a Division One running back, and he understands the position. So I certainly take what he, he, t- he says seriously. But I, I don't see a situation where we're talking about, you know, Leonard Fournette type inability to see the whole based on, on what I've seen the people I talk to. So I, I think he's top 40 guy, top 45 guy. Mm-hmm. And um, he feels like some of the, the second round picks we saw last year at the running back position who came in and, and had a pretty good start to their careers because they weren't asked to do a whole bunch, but what they were asked to do, they did at a pretty high level. Do you like the comparisons, uh, Travis Etienne to Alvin Kamara? I can see that for sure. And, and I've seen like the Le'Veon Bell to Najee Harris. If you squint, you can see that. Like uh, Le'Veon Bell, although came out of Michigan State, he was much heavier. Like he was too, I don't want to lie, but I think he was north of 230. And then obviously he got down and got himself into really good shape and was more of a sort of, you know, the patient guy behind the line of scrimmage. He wasn't that all the time at Michigan State. So I, I suppose I could see that with Najee Harris as well. But Travis 18 is special. Um, the issue is, and you guys know this, we were all pumped about Clyde edwards Lair going 32 last year. And at the end of the day, he wasn't the best running back in that class uh, based on production. That may change, of course. So we don't know how this is going to work out. It's basically a crapshoot. But based on what you see in college, there's no reason to think that ATN and, and Najee Harris won't be wildly successful in, in the NFL at some point. Uh, sorry to keep cutting Jamie out. Jamie, my next question will be for you after this one. What do people... Oh, I can listen to Ryan talk all day. <laughs> I'm fine. What do people make? I, 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 I thank you for letting me uh, just be on here to get it before everybody else. Does. Yeah. Uh, what do people make of Travis Etienne's senior season? Is it viewed as a disappointment? You know, it, I look, people make fun of me for yards per carry, but it was way down and 5.4 yards per carry is really not anything special for a college running back and just way, way down from his previous three seasons. What do people make of that? Yeah, the issue for me wasn't so much the yards per carry. It was that he he was a little looser with the football, which was curious. But I think when you talk to folks, no one seemed to really concerned about him hurting his draft stock. And you also, you know, you think back a year ago, you sort of understand why he came back. He said he came back because he wanted to win a national title. And I, I believe him. But he also that running back class was so deep last year and he wouldn't have been the first running back off the board. I don't think maybe, maybe the, the chiefs would have liked him at 32, uh, but I think he would have probably fallen in that second round glut and, and maybe even slipped to, to bottom around two early round three. And he, you know, as El saying goes, he made himself some money by coming back. Uh, although as to your point, Adam, he didn't set the world on fire. And, and yeah. that's why um, a year ago, Najee Harris was probably a day three guy. So I think him coming back, he did himself a, a lot of favors, and that's why I like him slightly more than Travis Etienne. But again, if either of those guys went 24 to, to the Steelers, for example, I would be ecstatic about it. But I think you you raise a fair question. like So what happened? And I think part of it was just that he wasn't as good as he was the year before. I don't think that's indicative of anything. It's just uh, the biggest concern for me was he was a little looser with the football, and that's something that, you know, that, that's something that teams will, will take very seriously. I think some people viewed Trevor Lawrence not as good as he was the year before, too. So, you know, I mean, it's just a byproduct of, you know, teams getting an extra year to see you and and understand what you do and trying to, you know, negate some of the things that you do well. 
Well, one thing that Travis Etienne does well, he's got the home run speed and he's a big play guy. And he also, Jamie, caught a lot of balls, 48 catches as a senior, 37 catches as a junior. So since we live in a kind of a PPR world these days, uh, you know, when you look at, I guess, Dynasty, could you make a case for Travis Etienne? I know it's a silly question to ask before we even know where he goes, but as the number one Dynasty running back. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, again, think about as Ryan brought up, you know, Clyde Edwards Hilaire was not expected to be the number one pick in most dynasty leagues. And he was because of where he ended up. So, you know, if we get, you know, Travis Etienne to a team that is going to feature him and feature him prominently, um, you know, Jacksonville would certainly be interesting if that's where he does end up, you know, because of the ability to grow with Trevor Lawrence and a new system with, you know, Urban Meyer and, and Daryl Bevel and the offensive you know staff that they have there. So, it could be a great landing spot for him. And I think if you get that situation, as opposed to, you know, we keep hearing and as Ryan is mocking and it just told you, you know, dolphins or the Steelers as two of the teams most you know likely to take Najee Harris in the first round, if it goes a different direction, you know, like Ryan said, Buffalo, you know, if, if Harris goes to Buffalo, while he would be the lead guy there, ETN and Jacksonville may be the better prospect for dynasty leagues just based on what that team does with their running backs compared to what the bills do with their running backs, for example. Okay. And uh, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong here, but Javante Williams, several years younger than Najee Harris. Najee Harris kind of old, 23 years old. So Javante Williams is younger than both of them. It would go Harris and then ETN and then Williams in terms of age. But from a dynasty standpoint, that's that might not be insignificant. So something to keep in mind. Uh, all right, we can move on here. Uh Blank, another fill in the blank, blank running backs will be selected in the first three rounds. Because we care a lot about those day two running backs, Ryan. How many total, if there's going to be, let's say, one in the first round, how many total in the first three rounds? I came up with with five. So we've talked about Najee, Etienne, and Javante. And then I think Michael Carter, Javante Williams' teammate goes. As I mentioned, he's about 20 pounds lighter, a little scat back ear, if you will. And then Kenneth Gainwell is the other name that I'll throw out there who played with Antonio Gibson at Memphis. And he's a similar type player. He's smaller than Antonio Gibson, but he he's incredibly effective as a receiver. He can run the ball out of the backfield. Uh, so I think he has a chance uh, to, to be a... a top three round guy. And then the question becomes, does a Trey Sermon slip in there who I, I don't love as much as some other people does a Ramondre Stevenson who I actually do like a little more. Does he find his way into the first round? And I'll mention one more guy who I think was on, on Prisco's better than team, uh, Demetric Felton who played at UCLA as a running back, worked out as a wide receiver at the senior bowl and did pretty well. And that again, puts him in that, you know, the, the Prisco airback term, a guy who can run and also, uh, catch the football coming on the backfield. But I'll stick with five A's or uh, guys that I think are almost certainly going to be top three round. And so, Jamie, I, do you think that this is going to be a running back class that really has a big impact in fantasy in 2021? I mean, destination is going to matter a lot for these guys, clearly. You know, so as we saw with last year's group, um, you know, think about when Antonio Gibson was drafted, for example. Think about when Zach Moss was drafted, for example. You know, those were the guys that were basically like four and five in terms of the fantasy rankings, you know, behind Clyde Edwards Hilaire, behind JK Dobbins, behind uh well, I guess maybe lower than four. Yeah, five, because you had Akers, right? you had Taylor. Yeah, yeah. They, they were probably like six and seven. Um, you know, so you, you you see where they ended up. When Gibson was drafted, Peterson was still Adrian Peterson was still on Washington's roster. Mm -hmm. And they moved on from him. And so, you know, we didn't think Gibson would have an immediate impact as a rookie. And then you look at Zach Moss, who went to a situation where there was Devin Singletary, who was good, not great as a rookie. And we thought, okay, he's a chance to come in and challenge for that job. And he, you know, he, he was a starter at points, but he didn't blow the doors off it, which is why I think Ryan is mentioning, you know, the Bills as a potential you know, landing spot for a running back. So destination is going to matter a lot. You know, so we could see, you know, a guy like Ramondre, Steve, Ramondre Stevenson. We could see a guy like Trey Sermon. We see a guy like Chuba, Hub Chuba Hubbard, you know, end up in a, in a good spot, you know, so... Uh, Khalil Herbert, any of these guys, they may end up, you know, Atlanta, the Jets, you know, teams that have starting needs, you know, if they end up with one of these guys, they could be, you know, very interesting for fantasy. And the flip side of that is, you know, we thought Keyshawn Vaughn was going to be, oh my gosh, the Bucks, they need a running back to pair with Ronald Jones. And he was a bust. Ugh, if they take, if they take a running back in the first round, it's just going to drive me crazy. But, you know, Ryan said five last year, we had 10 running backs taken in the top three rounds including Darrington Evans, who was the last of those 10. Keyshawn Vaughn, Zach Moss, Gibson, A.J. Dillon, don't forget about him. And then, of course, the, the names we know before that. 
Um, so that, to me, suggests, Ryan, that this is not a great running back class. It's funny you say that, because to me, it suggests that um, we were wrong about a lot of the running. We beat me uh, about a lot of the, when the running backs might go, because A.J. Dillon was sort of surprised for a number of reasons. Number one, that he went to Green Bay in the round two, but also that he, he went that early. Um, you mentioned Darrington Evans was sort of one of those dynamic players from App State that you weren't sure how, how, how much teams liked him. So there are some guys like that. Uh, Jamie mentioned Chuba Hubbard. He, he's a guy who, who's a sprint speed guy. Uh, there's Kylan Hill who opted out of Mississippi State, but he caught a ton of passes in that offense and opened the, the eyes of NFL teams in terms of him, him being able to do that. There's Elijah Mitchell out of Louisiana, who's another guy who catches a ton of passes. So if there's a, a premium on those type players, and we sort of saw that with some of the, the guys you mentioned that went in the top three rounds last year, maybe they do sneak into to the top uh, 109 picks, I think is what it is, uh, in those top three rounds. So these are just the guys that I like. And, you know, you have to sort of see through what other teams are thinking to, to make some of these other leaps, but it doesn't mean it won't happen. Um, so some of these players that we've been talking about that may not go that high, either they're too slow, either they haven't caught a lot of passes coming out of the backfield, uh, either they're not great blockers, whatever. But, you know, I say five, it could be seven or eight. And, and uh, you know, I wouldn't be shocked. By the way, I want to tell our listeners what we have on tap this week, uh, this show today. And then uh, tomorrow we'll talk about the veteran, the NFL players, the veterans that have the most to gain or lose based on the NFL draft. And then on Wednesday, we're going to have a mailbag for you. So I've got a lot of questions in my inbox, but please feel free to send more in. Apple podcast reviews would be great. Go to uh, go to our page on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review with a question. We'll read them. Also, fantasyfootball at cbsi.com. And remember... During the draft, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, youtube.com slash fantasy football today. Check out all the live coverage. All right, let's have fun here with Kyle Pitts. Blank will select Kyle Pitts. Ryan? I think it's the Falcons. Uh, I mean, Prisco's been talking about this for some time. He doesn't think that the Falcons are going to take a quarterback. He thinks Arthur Blank is all in on, on Matt Ryan for another year or two, even though they have a new coach and a new general manager. And here's the thing. like If you trade down at four, and I suspect there will be teams interested in trading up to four to get whether – it's Trey Lance, Mac Jones, or Justin Fields. If you're the Falcons and you move down, if you move down, you're not getting Kyle Pitts. I mean, that's just the end of the conversation because either the Bengals or the Dolphins are going to take him at five or six. And presumably you're not moving trading with those teams who already have quarterbacks. So that's the math you're doing. And if you trade down, you're not getting likely Jamar Chase. We saw a report on Monday from Peter King that maybe Julio Jones could be moved, which, which seems crazy, but they need that cap space. Um, could you trade down for a cornerback? Yeah, if you're the Falcons, you could. But again, what gives you more value in terms of making that football team better, I think it's Kyle Pitts. So if I'm the Falcons and I'm not taking Justin Fields, Max Jones, Trey Lance, I'm staying put and taking taking Kyle Pitts. Jamie, fill in the blank. Blank will take Kyle Pitts. I think it's it's Atlanta, but I, I, I also wouldn't be surprised if a team traded up with the Falcons to maybe even take Pitts. You know, like Ryan is saying, you know, they're trading up to get the quarterback, but um, you know, if teams fall in love and obviously you're Dallas, you know, I don't know if Dallas is going to go from 10 to, <laughs> to 4, but um, you know, if a team really loves him that much and it's hard not to love him that much, then you could see maybe a, a team being, you know, overly aggressive. I think it was on um, on the NFL Network this morning on Good Morning Football. There was uh, a segment that they do where the Giants actually traded up. You know, I don't know who was doing the Giants. I saw just a screen grab of it on Twitter, but the Giants gave their first, their second, Evan Ingram and something else to move up to four to get pits, you know, and it was, um, you know, something that on paper makes some sense, but, you know, obviously something that's not likely to happen, but still, uh, I would say it's four is where he goes, but the Falcons do make some sense, especially if they do decide to move on from Julio Jones and get another playmaker. Yeah. And Emery made a good point last week though. Cause I said, who would you take the, your top rated wide receiver, which for him was Devonte Smith or Kyle Pitts. And he took the, he took the wide receiver. And I think, you know, let's just say it's Jamar Chase. Draft. What do you mean? This draft is so deep with wide receivers. Like, you yeah, get but and, it's and, it's not deep with Jamar Chase. You know what I mean? So, it, like, we when you were when you were faking a power outage because you didn't want to be on the show earlier, <laughs> right. we we said Ryan said that Jamar Chase might be the best wide receiver prospect since Julio Jones. Why would I take a tight end over that? I would take the wide receiver, even if I'm Atlanta. You know, even if I have two good wide receivers, why would I take a tight end over the best wide receiver if if that wide receiver is really on that level? But let me push back on that and just ask you this. Would you take the bet? What if Kyle Pitts ends up being the best pass catcher in this draft class, which I think is quite possible. Like you're talking about like Darren Waller. Feel, this is going to be a hyperbole, but Darren, Darren Waller feels like his floor. Whereas, you know, Julio Jones is almost certainly Jamar Chase's ceiling. 
and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but my point is that I don't think Kyle Pitts is a tight end. I just think we call him that. I think you can put him anywhere. Like I sort of right. joke, he he could kick field goals and he'd probably be an all pro <laughs> next year if you well, want him to do well, that. Well, then why would he why would he have more of an impact than Jamar Chase? Because let let's say he's not we it's hard to know how what kind of a blocker he's going to become. I, I don't think most tight ends come into the NFL as with a reputation right. of being a great blocker. They can develop it. But if you're just lining him up out wide and you're lining Jamar Chase up out wide, who do you think would put up better numbers in the same offense with the same quarterback? You know what I mean? Who would I mean, put up Chase better? Would, but, right. That's so then why would you take Pitts over Chase? But but you can again, put, Chase is not going to do the things at tight end that, that Kyle Pitts is going to do at tight end. So is he a tight um, end though? Like that's we keep saying he might well, be a wide one way, you gotta go the other way too. Yeah, but okay, sure. So he has to become a, a good blocker. But th- just think about and, and this is, you know, you know, we get criticized a lot for our fantasy picks. You know, Ryan has a much more maddening job trying to, you know, put these players to these teams and, and make that that match. But, you know, you think about the receivers over the last you know few years coming into the into the league. Go back to last year. Henry Ruggs was the first receiver drafted. Argue however you want if that should have been the case or not. So far, year one bust. Jerry Judy, not long after. So far, you would say bust, right? I'd, um, I'm going to. Look, TJ Hawkinson. I, 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 I would push back on that too, but I'm saying just the way <laughs> okay, that he good. <laughs> performed in year one did not live up to being a first round caliber wide receiver. CD Lamb was great. Uh, Jalen Rager was a bust. Justin Jefferson was great. You know, it's like it, it's crapshoot at that position. Think it's about crapshoot the last in every two, position. It's crapshoot at every position. Totally agree. But think about the last two Super Bowls. What did they have in common? I, Tar- Travis okay, Kelsey, no, then you're Kittle, right. You're right. That is Travis a great Kelsey point. Kelsey and Rob Gronkowski. If you find one of those well, guys, Gronk is not. What are you doing this, in the Super Bowl? This version of Gronk, but okay, but they didn't get to the Super Bowl because of Rob Gronkowski this year. True, but Rob Gronkowski so. is one of the best football players ever, and so I, I, mean, I totally and get again, that. The flip and, side of that is those guys weren't first round picks, so that's the other argument yeah. to that. So it, it, it goes either way. But this guy is a unicorn. You know, you you, you get an opportunity to draft him and put him into a system, especially if you're Arthur Smith, who's a former tight end coach who has had success with that position as a coordinator. Like it just makes so much sense for him to go to the Falcons where there's, you know, Hayden Hurst is a good player, but this guy's a difference maker. Yeah. Yeah. Hayden has one year left in his deal too. And you look, you're not drafting him to block anyone at, at four. Right. Either. Like you can line him up anywhere and I'll just say this and then we can move on if you want to Adam. He didn't drop a single pass last year, and he was going up against SEC cornerbacks, safeties, and linebackers. They're going to be first, second, third round picks. And there's some guys like uh, JC JC Horn, who's going to be a first round pick. Joe Horn's son, who's a cornerback, he had a tough go against Kyle Pitts. Uh, Kelvin Joseph, who's going to be a first or second round pick from Kentucky, he absolutely demolished that poor kid. And that kid is really good. So you see that, and you're like, okay. And look, you could argue Jamar Chase does the same thing. Yeah, right. That's uh, that's my point. I love Kyle Pitts. Everybody should love Kyle Pitts. But I do think wide receivers have a little bit more of an impact than tight ends. Unless you're talking about a guy. I think George Kittle's the best tight end in football because he's more complete. Uh, you know, if, if, if Pitts became that type of player where he's a, a monster blocking, that'd be another thing. But the best wide receiver in football versus the best tight end in football, I'm probably taking the best wide receiver. All right, let me ask you a specific question, then then we can move on if you want, and let's ask another stupid question. All right, so let's say that uh, Jamar Chase goes to the Bengals, Kyle Pitts goes to the Falcons. Who's more productive next year? I would guess Chase, because okay. tight well, ends are rarely... <laughs> what do you think? I think it's Pitts. See, if, if you're the Falcons, right, you know that Julio's at the end of his line. You, I think, if, if I saw this correctly, they only have 20 players on their roster right now that are, that have a salary. <laughs> wow. It's like some ridiculous, like they, they their, their rosters in shambles. So if you want a chance to compete this year, what's the best way for the Falcons to compete is to score as many points as you possibly can, because your defense is probably going to be horrible. So you line up Julio, Calvin Pitts, and take the best of still Matt Ryan and say, we're going to score 40 points a game. If we can, what do you make of the fact that we just know that rookie tight ends typically don't do that well. But to Ryan's point, he's not a typical tight end. Like, yeah. he's going to... I know, but, I mean, Chris brought up the point. Vernon Davis was this kind of freak. He didn't... Oh. I don't think he did that much as a rookie. Um, but he's also stepping into a situation where he doesn't have to be the focal point. I, I know, and... People, please don't... Uh, everybody, please don't interpret this as my hating on Kyle Pitts. I think he should probably go, you know... I don't know, seventh or eighth at the latest. But 
Jamar Chase could obviously have a huge rookie season too. And no matter how good the tight ends have been, it's they really just don't do much in their rookie season. It, it so it seems anyway. But you're also not looking. You know, you're drafting. You're not looking your rookie season. You're looking. For but what the these question guys are going to do was who. Right. What yeah. was the question, Ryan? It was Jamar Chase Next goes year. to the Bengals and Pitts goes to the Falcons. Who has more production in 2021? That was the question. Right. I said Jamar right, but Chase. But it's also like, is it, and this goes for both players, is it production leading to wins or is it empty production leading to, you know, stats? I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. I, like, if you're just telling me who's going to have better stats, I would guess it's Jamar Chase. Like, if Kyle Pitts goes, you know, what, 55, 608? Is that a more impactful season than Jamar Chase going 75, 1,007? No. 600, 400 yards? No. That's a huge what difference. What I'm saying is like, you know, that's the typical rookie tight end. That's good. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's why I think but Jamar two, Chase would be better. But year two, if Kyle sure. Pitts is the guy that we think he is, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating discussion. It really is going to be fun to see it play out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, all right, let's finish and up our Brian's fill in the wrong, blank. You get everybody hit. Let's fill the, finish up our <laughs> fill in the blank here, and um, and then we'll take a look deeper at the mock draft. Uh, so, Ryan, let's just go. Uh, Ryan and Jamie, real quick, just give me quick answers. Blank is the most likely team to trade up. Patriots. I think once we get past three to see how the quarterbacks sort themselves out, the Patriots would presumably be interested in trying to get whatever guy is left over. I'll say Denver once they see Mac Jones at three. Blank is the most likely team to trade down. I think it's the Panthers. I don't have a ton of draft picks. We'll see what happens. They have Sam Darnold. Um, I, I feel like they're committed to him, but we'll see. So I, I think the Panthers may try to accumulate picks if, if they're sold, in quotation marks, on Sam Darnold for a year or two. I think it's Miami if it goes the, the three quarterbacks, as we expect, with Jones being three. And if the Falcons and Bengals stay and it goes Pitts and Chase and they lose out on both those guys and they don't want Sewell, then they trade back. But I think it's trading back to nine with the Broncos. Blank is the most overrated first round prospect. Uh, you know, this is sort of funny because this wouldn't have been my answer a month ago, but I, I'm going to go with Mac Jones just because people hate him so much. And I've been driving the Mac Jones bandwagon for a few months now. I think that he, ha he has no chance of uh, social media success <laughs> in terms of the eyes of folks on social media, like the, the, the Twitter mafia. So I'll say Mac Jones, even though I like him, I think he's going to be good. But in terms of the expectations, him meeting those things in year one, uh, I don't know. Yeah, he's just in a bad spot. Bad okay. spot. It's Mac Jones for sure. The most underrated first round prospect. Uh, just because you hate him so much, I'm going with Kyle Pitts because I want to make sure that he's <laughs> getting... <laughs> No, I'm going to go with uh, Pete's guy, Pete Prisco's guy, Jamin Davis, the linebacker out of Kentucky, who the media folks haven't been talking about for a while. We we just sort of recently got on him in the last month or so. Uh, but he he has a chance to be to be really good. In fact, and Pete says this. This is Pete's words, not mine, but he thinks he's going to be better than Micah Parsons. I think Micah Parsons has some off-field issues that may see him drop a little bit, but Jamin Davis is a, f a fun off-ball linebacker. We're seeing more and more of those guys go in the first round. I'm going to stay in my lane and go with Kadarius <laughs> Tony. I think he's going to be fun wherever he ends up. I think he's going to be a difference maker right away. I don't think he's going to have a great rookie season in terms of production, in terms of stats because of the type of player that he is, but he's going to have a lot of big impact plays because of the type of player that he is. All right, we're going to take a break here. When we come back, we will break down Ryan's mock draft with three quarterbacks going with the first three picks. Who does he have going third overall? And we'll talk more about Kyle Pitts, I'm sure. No, I will. Probably not. Uh, but we'll, we got a lot to talk about. We'll be right back on Fantasy Football today. 40 minutes in, we haven't talked about quarterbacks. How about that? Zach Wilson, two. Of course, Trevor Lawrence, one. So who is it going to be at number three? But before we get to that, Ryan, how good is Trevor Lawrence? Well, here's the thing, uh, and Jamie sort of touched on this earlier. He he had a you know he wasn't necessarily great throughout the twenty twenty one uh, twenty season. Excuse me. Part of that was probably COVID related. Um, he wasn't great to start his sophomore season. I mean, there were times, in fact, early on in that sophomore season, the first three or four games, we're like, okay, this isn't the same guy we saw as a freshman. What's going on? And I've often equated that to Justin Fields only playing a year and a half, and why people don't seem to be as high on him as they probably they should. I think he's going to be a really good player. He just needs a little more time to go into the role, and that's fine. But if Trevor Lawrence is, I've been saying this for a while, if Trevor Lawrence is 75% of Justin Herbert in year one, that's a home run for the Jaguars. I don't, like, Justin Herbert played out of his mind at uh, for the Chargers. And I was shocked. I think a lot of people were shocked how well he played, but a credit to him for doing it. And I don't know if Trevor Lawrence can can reach that in year one in a in an organization that isn't as put together as Los Angeles for whatever warts the, the Chargers do have. So I'm going to say 
75 percent of justin herbert is a great start but I, i'm sort of hesitant to see how this is going to play out just just with all the moving parts urban meyer is he going to stay the playmakers around him the issues uh you know on defense so on and so forth and you have mac jones going third so we had a tweet from Rappaport last night that it's between mac jones and trey lance uh, what do you think? I wasn't laughing at that. Sorry. Mac Jones and Trey Lance. Um, something crazy going out of my house right now. Uh, what do you think is Mac Jones? I, I think, but again, that's just a hunch. Uh, I think he fits like he's like the best of what Kyle Shanahan wants. And I know we always think about the picture of Mac Jones with a shirt off looking like me in a tank top going to the beach to you know sit in a lounge chair and drink six pack. <laughs> but I say all the time, like go back and look at the scouting reports last year for Tua. They're literally word for word the exact same thing that people say about Mac Jones, but there's no but behind it. But he looks like a slob, but whatever. People had no issue with Mac, uh, with Tua being a top five pick except for the hip, and he still won the top five. I say all the time on the Pick Six podcast, if you take Mac Jones's head and put it on Tua's body, everyone's like, oh, that guy's a top five pick all day long. And, and I think it's literally a case of body shaming and the fact that his middle name is McCorkle. So I, I think those <laughs> two things really go against him. And I said earlier, I think it's going to be unfair to whoever goes three because of the, the pressure that goes playing a playing for 49ers after giving them the three first-round picks. But, you know, when you talk to people in Senior Bowl, the coaching staff that was there, and, and the Panthers were the coaching staff uh, of, of the Mac Jones team, and the scouts that were there, they all say that Mac Jones is so incredibly smart. And I don't mean like, oh, he's smart for a, a senior in, in college. He's smart for a guy who's been in the league four or five or six years. And that to me just screams Kyle Shanahan because people say, oh, he looks, he's basically Jimmy G 2.0. You, I mean, you can all recall times where Shanahan was visibly frustrated with what Garoppolo wasn't capable of doing, not physically, but it seems like in terms of just execution. And I think Mac Jones gives him that. That said, if it were Justin Fields or Trey Lance, I'd be like, oh, I can see that too because Shanahan's so good at his job. Basically, anyone fits Shanahan's system, but I'm, you know, I've been riding the Mac Jones train for a while, so I'm going to stick on it for a few more days. I think if it, if it ends up being Jones, it's, you know, because Shanahan feels it's the best fit for what he does. And, you know, the, the knock on any Alabama quarterback, which is understandable, or any quarterback coming from an elite program is, well, he played with all of this talent around him. He's stepping into a situation, Mac Jones, with a very good offensive line, an above average offensive line, obviously, in a great system with pretty good weapons around him in George Kittle, Ayuk, and Debo Samuel. It may not be the best but it's certainly in the upper half of the league and a run game that's going to support him and a defense is not going to put him in some bad situations. He's going to probably look a lot better than what the expectations are right now. Now, that being said, it feels as if, and if you talk to you know Pete Prisco, for example, our, our, our NFL senior columnist, drink. Um, I don't have my water, that, sorry. That uh, you know Justin Fields is the, is the better pick. I think probably a lot of people feel that way. Trey Lance feels like maybe he has the higher ceiling of all these guys because you just don't know. And the hope is that he becomes... Uh, Steve McNair, or he becomes, you know, Josh Allen, you know, the, the, the names you're hearing most associated to him. So it, it could really go any one of those three ways. It just feels as if Mac Jones is a reach at that point. But like Ryan told you, you know, it, it, if you, if you were to swap out the names and just looked at the numbers, you would say, Oh, this guy's not bad. And if you said it was Tua as opposed to Mac Jones, you'd say, okay, it makes a lot of sense. So we'll see if Mac Jones goes there. I personally would take Justin Fields, but you know, if the 49ers feel like that's the direction they want to go, they have a few years to prove it, and they may be at a job if Mac Jones doesn't. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll just say this quickly, Adam. Um, here, here's the thing: like, this is what's going to be hysterical. Let's say Justin Fields goes three, and he's successful, and, and all that. Uh, when the Patriots take Mac Jones in five years from now, they have won two Super Bowls with Mac Jones. People are going to be screaming as to why the 49ers didn't take Mac Jones when they yep. had a chance. I uh, so Kyle Pitts four. You have him going to the Falcons. You do not have Jamar Chase going to the Bengals. You have Penny Sewell going to the Bengals, the offensive tackle out of Oregon. And then you have Chase and Waddle back to back to the Dolphins at six and to the Lions at seven. So, Jamie, uh, who would you rank higher, Chase on the Dolphins or Waddle on the Lions? I would rank Chase higher. Um, I, I think Waddle goes into a situation where he's the number one receiver right away. Obviously, Chase goes to a situation where he's, uh, you know, eventually will become the number one guy. But, you know, Will Fuller, Devontae Parker, and, and Mike Gusecki are going to make that a little harder on him. Uh, clearly you look at the lions and TJ Hawkinson and then a bunch of stiffs at wide receiver. So it's a, it's a great landing spot, I think for both guys, but you know, chase based on him as a prospect based on his you know profile as a prospect. And I think what the upside would be in the Miami offense would be the better fantasy option going into year one. Okay, Ryan. So let me get your take on this. Here's what I, what I fear about Waddle is that he will be 
and again, we live in sort of a PPR world, he will be a low catch guy, which is, you know, look, Tyreek Hill's a low catch guy. And I'm not saying he won't be a great pro, but he might be maybe like a gala, not that the same player, but just in terms of stats, high yards per catch, not a lot of catches, hopefully a lot of touchdowns. Um, I, I was going to compare him to Kenny Galladay. I had Shraggy B break down the four regular season games that Waddle and Devontae Smith played together. Now, the national championship game was another story. Waddle came back. Smith had 200 yards and a half. It was incredible. But <laughs> the four games they played together in the regular season, Smith had 13 more catches, uh, 25 catches for Waddle, 38 for Smith. They both had four touchdowns. But Waddle had 557 yards and Smith had 483. But, you know, it just, just you know, look, I know it's not going to translate directly, but just from a, a fantasy football perspective, 38 catches, 483 yards compared to 25 catches, 557 yards. I kind of feel like people would gravitate toward the higher catch guy. Do you think Jalen Waddle is, um, is he a true number one? Is he... Now, who do you compare him to? Is he going to be an 80-catch guy? I don't think he's going to be a 100-catch guy or anything like that. Like, What do you think? So Devontae Smith is my wide receiver, too. And we were talking earlier that he would be my wide receiver, one, if he weighed 20 pounds more. So I like Devontae Smith more. I, I think that Jalen Waddle goes sooner because of the, the athleticism and the high-end traits and all that stuff that we hear about. I think you sort of hit on it with Tyreek Hill. He's sort of that mold of player. Is he Tyreek Hill? No, but he's he's not that much taller. He's only 5'10". He doesn't weigh, he's not as, as rocked up as the kids say as Tyreek is. Um, but I think you're exactly right. I think you're onto something in terms of um, high yardage, low catch, uh, a lot of touchdowns. He adds something in the run game and excuse me, in the return game. But again, and we talk about this with quarterbacks going to the right spot. You're going to Detroit, man. I mean, you're going to a, a place where Matthew Stafford's gone and you're counting on Jared Goff, presumably because they're not taking a quarterback here. If they're taking Jalen model who, by the way, if you can't have success in Sean McVay system, what chance do you have in Dan Campbell's system that we don't even know what it is in a historically dysfunctional organization? So I, I think it's another situation where it's not a great landing spot for anyone, but I, I think you're hitting on something in terms of what the production will look like for Jalen Waddle compared to Devontae Smith. I would expect, expect Devontae Smith to be more productive as a, as a rookie, assuming they went to the same landing spot, but but um, I think Jalen Waddle is still growing in that role because he's never been a number one. We were talking about Terrace Marshall er earlier. Jalen Waddle's played with three of the first rounders, and he's rarely had to be be the guy. In fact, he's never had to be the guy at Alabama. And then you've got all right. So I'll just skip down just a little bit because I want to keep this wide receiver discussion going. Is Devonte Smith to the Giants at eleven? Jamie, is that a good landing spot for a wide receiver? Would you want to see Devonte Smith or one of those big three go to the Giants? I mean, it's not going to be great for what his rookie production probably is, but. You know, you're talking about Stoney Shepard and, and Darius Slayton. You know, Slayton is the one that's going to be the odd man out. Shepard is, uh, I believe, on the last year of his deal. And so, you know, if Daniel Jones is the guy that, you know, you clearly hope him to be, Adam, most Giants fans hope him to be, or, you know, positive ones, um, then you're doing what you should do to a young quarterback is surround him with talent, you know. And so you you bring in Kenny Galladay. You draft Devontae Smith. You still have Shepard and Slayton for this year. That's as good as any team will roll out there if Devontae Smith is – the player that he was in college, clearly. So um, it's not my favorite that landing spot for him, but it's a spot that I think by year two, he can flourish as the type of fantasy receiver that we love. And maybe by year three, he's a star. You know, So um, that all depends on how good Daniel Jones is and what the Giants coaching staff looks like by then. All right, and then the picks I skipped in between Waddle at seven and Smith at 11. You have Justin Fields going ace to the Panthers. Rashawn Slater, the offensive lineman out of Northwestern. Do you think he's a tackle or a guard? I've talked to teams that think he's a tackle. I've talked to teams that think he's a guard. I think he can play either place and help right away. So the Broncos, who knows what the Broncos are going to do? Jamie's talking about them possibly taking a quarterback. But if you're rolling with Drew Locke, you might as well protect him or Teddy Bridgewater, whoever it is. And I think Rashawn Slater gives you that versatility. And then you have Trey Lance going 10th. I, Jamie, I think they, they should take a quarterback. I just don't think Drew Locke is the answer. It's kind of weird to say that. It's like, how can I say the Giants shouldn't take a quarterback, but the Broncos should? Well, because in this scenario, all five quarterbacks are off the board by the time the Giants pick. Where in Ryan's mock, you still have Trey Lance on the board uh, for the Broncos at nine. Um, what would you do if you were the Broncos at nine? I mean, I'm taking a quarterback. I, I just think you, you got to give Drew Locke 
some pressure, you know, to prove that he's the guy. And if he, you know, excels, then you, you know, play it out and see how it all works out. But um, if Trey Lance is sitting there and I'm Denver, I, I have a hard time passing on him. Obviously, if Justin Fields is sitting there, that's a no brainer. Uh, but like I said, I think Denver is going to be uh, aggressive. And if, you know, it is Mac Jones at three and you still have Justin Fields and Trey Lance on the board, four, five, six, you know, I think those are, are prime spots for Denver to jump up a few spots. It's going to, you know, cost them their first and probably their second. But, uh, you know, if as long as it's not mortgaging the future too much, you know, you go out and see if you can get one of those guys. And, you know, that's a great friend. That's a great roster right now. The offensive line is in good shape. The receiving core is in good shape. The defense is rebuilt. The run game should be strong. The quarterback is the question, you know, and, and Fields to me is the likely answer to help them right away. Lance probably more so down the road. All right, Jamie, I think you have to hop off now. I do. Ryan, I love you. You're the best. I hope uh, this week goes well for you and all of your picks are successful and uh, we will share our parenting stories another time. Oh, thank yeah. You, we were supposed to get a parenting you. story. Oh, we got That's gypped. Right. All right. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Ryan and I will finish up. As we look at pick 12, you have the Philadelphia Eagles and kind of interesting the way this played out, getting Patrick Sertan. And I just thought at 12, all you need is is one defensive player to get taken in the top 11. Assuming the five quarterbacks are going to get taken in the top 10. You just need one defensive player, and then you're going to get one of those wide receivers or maybe a quarterback drops or something like Maybe one of those five quarterbacks drops at 12. But the first 11 picks are all offense for you. So, right? So the Eagles take Patrick Sertan at 12 as the first defensive player off the board. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned that because I went back and looked last week because I had nothing else to do. How far you have to go back to find a defensive player falling out of the top 10 pick. And it's 1957. What? <laughs> so wow. a, a defensive player goes in the top 10 every single year. And don't forget, I mean, you know, 30, 20, 30, 40 years ago, defensive players, defensive tackles sometimes were the first overall pick and because defense was, was sort of, uh, that's how you built your team. So this would be ab absolutely unprecedented. And almost hysterical. I mean, you're a Giants fan. You could appreciate the fact that the, the Eagles are trying to manipulate the board. They're going to get a playmaker, and then they trade on 12, and they have to settle for a defensive player. The good news is they need help in that secondary desperately. But, I mean, they traded down from six where they could have had Jalen Waddell, Justin Fields, uh, you know, if they were going in that direction, uh, Rashawn Slater, if they decided to stay put, Devontae Smith. And instead, they have to settle, quote-unquote, for Patrick Sertan. Fields need, but it's not as uh, a sexy a pick as one of these receivers. So example. what do you think about Sertan and, and this defensive back class? We're going to start seeing cornerbacks come off the board at, around here. Cornerbacks and edge rushers going to kind of take over for a little while. Yeah, so the best case scenario for the Eagles here is if the Broncos pick a cornerback or maybe the, the Cowboys do a 10 and don't trade down. But my cornerback won up until a month ago was Caleb Farley. Uh, he didn't play last year. He opted out. But he is, in terms of physical traits, he's probably the best in this class. He's big, he's strong, he's fast, and he's a converted wide receiver, so he's only going to get better. Patrick Sertan is, feels like the, the most certain uh, of the bunch to, to be a solid NFL pro, and, and that's really all you want. You can sort of bet on flash and have that blow up in your face. And then right behind him is J.C. Horn. Uh, and we mentioned him earlier. Joe Horn's son, he's big, he's physical. Uh, he's a, he can dominate at times in man-to-man -man coverage. Then after that, there's Greg, uh, Greg uh, Newsom, excuse me, out of uh, Northwestern. Fantastic season um, for him. He plays more of a quarters cover four type look, uh, but he can certainly do other things if you need him to. So those are the top four or five guys. And the question becomes whether Sir Tanner Horn goes first. And then also how far does Caleb Farley fall if teams are, in, are worried about his, his injury, hit a back injury, a back procedure a, a few weeks ago that uh, the second one he's had. And, and I've talked to teams that are actually legitimately concerned about him no longer the top five pick, but a top 10 pick, excuse me, maybe do we even take him at the bottom of round one. Yeah. And Sertan, what a recruit he was. I remember his recruitment. It, he was top five overall recruit. I mean, just like he's he got pedigree on a high school team with Tyson Campbell from Georgia, who uh -huh. also has a chance to be a first round pick. And both those guys are six, one, um, Sertan weighs a little more. He's probably one ninety five, maybe. And uh, Tyson Campbell's one eighty five, but I can't imagine being a high school quarterback trying to throw against two, uh, you know, <laughs> five star kids that that are uh, dominating in the SEC. All right, you got the Chargers, who PFF had as, as one of the worst offensive lines, if not the worst, in football last year, taking Virginia Tech offensive lineman Christian Darrisaw at thirteen. Then you got Quiddy Pay, your first edge rusher. Quiddy Pay going to Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, they don't have a lot of pick, a lot of capital, right? Um, 
Right. So they, they don't got, have a second round pick. Yeah, they got to nail this pick, and pass rusher makes sense for them. Um, and I think that this is going to end up being a good. I I can't really see them adding a wide receiver. So I think you know if you have Justin Jefferson, I I don't know that you should be too concerned about them taking a wide receiver early in the draft anyway. Minnesota, uh, J C Horn to the Cowboys, who in this mock traded down with the uh, from ten to fifteen with the Patriots. Horn, the cornerback out of South Carolina, you just heard about. The Cardinals take Elijah Vera Tucker, offensive lineman at sixteen. And then you got a linebacker. So tell me about Jeremiah Owusu Karamoa uh, at a Notre Dame linebacker going, going to the Raiders at seventeen. So he is this next wave of hybrid type players, uh, Isaiah Simmons of the world, and that begs the question: Okay, where do you play him? Because I know I, I've talked to teams that say, "Well, he can't play linebacker; he's too small." He showed up at his pro day weight two twenty one. He didn't weigh that, I don't think, during the season. But even Brian Kelly, the Notre Dame coach, said at the pro day, you have to have a spot for Usu Kormoa. You can't just throw him out there as sort of a do-all, uh, catch-all type player because that's not utilizing what he does best. And we sort of saw that last year with Isaiah Simmons, who struggled early on in his season in Arizona because they couldn't really find a spot for him. Um, so I, I've talked to teams that like him more as a safety where he can cover running backs, uh, even wide receivers out of the slot, tight end, and he can do it at a high level. He's incredibly athletic. And I've talked to teams that like him as a, as a dime backer. And, you know, a lot of teams' defenses play those sub packages all the time now because there's so many wide receivers on the field, and they feel like he can do everything you want. And it's just a matter, again, it's sort of the recurring theme of, of what I've been saying, in the right system. Now, the Raiders may not be the right system because they have needs everywhere, but they need athletes and they need defensive help. And, and uh, Usa Cormo checks both those boxes. So find a place for him. Let him do that. And, and I think he'll be successful. All right. Back to your mock draft here. Um, we got Najee Harris of the Dolphins at 18. And then you talked about this guy. I think this is who you said was the underrated linebacker, yep. right? Jamin Davis going to the Washington football team at 19. Uh, Caleb Farley out of Virginia Tech. You just talked about him, how you had him as number one. Uh, he opted out. He's got some medical issues. He's cornerback going to the Bears at 20. 21 is the Indianapolis Colts. Tevin Jenkins, offensive lineman out of Oklahoma State. And Jalen Phillips to Tennessee. So, yeah, you've got uh, edge rushers coming off the board in three straight picks. you got Jalen Phillips to Tennessee. Carlos Boogie Basham out of Wake Forest going to the Jets. Jalen Phillips, by the way, out of Miami. And Jason Owe out of Penn State going to Pittsburgh. So Tennessee, the Jets, and the Steelers all getting edge rushers. Do you have a strong preference between Phillips, Basham, and Owe? If Phillips is healthy, it's him. And that's the big thing. He has concussion history. He retired actually after UCLA where he began his career. So if the medical's clear, it's him. Uh, Boogie Basham, NFL teams like him more than, than media folks do. Uh, he's like 274. And so he can play up and down the, the defensive line. And Jason Owe is... He's just learning. He literally started playing football as a junior in high school, and he had zero sacks last year at Penn State, but he is so quick twitch, and you can see him being uh, trying to figure it out, and once he does, I think he's going to be really good. He ran a 4-4 at his pro day. All right. Talented edge rushers. You can get late in the first round. We'll go to the 25th pick. It's Jacksonville, um, and it's Levi Onzurike, defensive lineman out of Washington. So where does he play on the line? Where do you expect him to play? It's funny. I talked to him uh, a month or so ago, early in the draft process, and he opted out again. But when you when you watch him play 2019, he plays over the center. He can play over the guard. He can play over the tackle. He can line up out wide. He can play anywhere. And he is his first step is one of the quickest in this draft uh, as an interior defensive lineman. He has incredibly strong hands, and he has a, a, a several pass uh, rush moves that get him into the backfield consistently. So. Uh, he may not be the first defensive tackle off this board, and we talked earlier that's a pretty weak class there. Either he or Christian Barmer are probably the likely candidates, but Jaguars need big guys on both offense and defense, and I think uh, he makes sense for the Jags here as their second first-round pick, although they could go offensive line for sure, for sure. This is the surprising one here is Micah Parsons all the way down at 26. So why do you have him so low going to the Browns, linebacker out of Penn State, who you know, many thought... I mean, I guess he still has a chance to be the first defensive player selected. You have him 26th. Yeah, it's all maturity concerns. That's all it is. He's a top five talent. And the concerns are he had some issues at Penn State early in his career. And I've talked to teams that are like, well, that was just he was lack of maturity. He, he has he, That doesn't necessarily define him. But there are other concerns about, okay, does he love football? Uh, like what happens? And I'm guilty. I would be guilty of this too if I were 21 or 22 and someone gave me $10 million. What happens when you give him a bunch of money? Is he going to be solely focused on football? Is that what he wants to do? 
Uh, and there are some issues there. So taken together, maybe he slips a little bit. I don't know if he slips to 26. Maybe instead of going seven or eight or nine, he goes 15 or 16. But it, it's a concern. Like NFL teams are talking about it. Okay. Pick 27, edge rusher, Aziz Ojolari going to Baltimore. And I think a lot of people have Baltimore taking a wide receiver here. Uh, how do you realistic? Because you still, at this point, 27 picks now, you still only have three wide receivers off the board. Kadarius Tony's going to come off in a couple more picks. But you went defense for Baltimore. Yeah, so they lost Enoch Ngakwe. They lost Matt Judon. Their edge rush situation is, I wouldn't call it dire, but it's not great. And they do have Hollywood Brown and, and Miles Boykin. And they do have that other first-round pick, Adam, right. that they got for Orlando Brown. So maybe they'll circle back and, and think about a wide receiver at the okay. final round. One. Yeah, let's do that. I, I, I like the guy you have there, but I don't want him to go to Baltimore. Uh, <laughs> Greg Newsom, Greg Newsom going to the Saints at 28, cornerback out of Northwestern. All right, this would be very interesting. Darius Toney to the Packers. So that's 29th overall. That's the fourth wide receiver off the board. Then you got Zaven Collins, linebacker out of Tulsa, going to the Bills. Terrace Marshall to the Ravens at 31. We already talked about him earlier. And uh, Trayvon Merrig, the safety out of TCU, going to Dallas in a mock trade with Tampa Bay. That is Tampa Bay's pick. You have the Cowboys trading back in to get Merrig the safety here. But Kadarius Toney, I want to finish on him. Fourth wide receiver off the board for you. Drops down to 29th. Goes to Green Bay, which is a really interesting spot. But what separates Toney from... The other really talented, I don't, I don't know, is he small? Because he's, he's, he's six 5'11". feet. Yeah, 5'11", okay. Not necessarily an outside guy, but what separates him from the Moors of the world? You know, well, Why is he fourth? He's bigger than Elijah and Rondell Moore. Um, is he as dynamic? Probably not, but he had a great season at Florida, as, as you know. And I think uh, he's another guy. We talk about Najee Harris. He's another guy who came back and, and made himself some money because he played at such a high level, and he did it sharing... Uh, the football with Kyle Pitts and Trevon Grimes. So I, I like the fit, and there's some concerns. He may fall out of the first round. Like Rashad Bateman, it could also be an option here. But I like the idea of finally the Packers giving uh, Aaron Rodgers some help. And I was yelling and screaming last year that I wanted them to trade for Will Fuller because they just won more person. Of course, Will Fuller went and got suspended, so that blew up my face. But the point is, you had Devontae Adams. You get uh, another slot receiver who can sort of reprise what we had in Randall Cobb. And Kadarius Tony feels like that type of player. And Aaron Rodgers is probably happy. And if that makes him happy and you can win one more game down the stretch, which is what came, they came up short doing that, wh why wouldn't he do it? Like, why why do you not want to get receivers? Which is, lat, Adam, you know this, last year was the deepest wide receiver class in a uh, millennium. And they didn't even sign one in, as an undrafted free agent. So I would like to think that they would make a uh, do something differently here. Not draft a quarterback, for example, even though I like Jordan Love. And get Aaron Rodgers uh, a playmaker. And I think Kadarius Tony fits that bill. He doesn't have to do it all with Devontae Adams standing next to him. I think you mean to say, who is Kadarius Tony? Thank you. Sorry. That's, that's how we have everything's jeopardy now when you talk about the Packers. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Good stuff, man. Good talk to you, Azer. Yeah, always always good to have you on. And uh, your info is great. Please check out all of his mock drafts on CBSports.com, including the one I did not get a chance to talk about. Uh, from October 20th, 2020, <laughs> where you did have Trevor Lawrence going one, Justin Fields two, Panay Sewell three, Trey Lance four, Micah Parsons five. Nice. Do you remember who you had going six to the Miami Dolphins? He is not is even Zach a first Wilson? rounder. I would say the biggest faller of the draft process. Oh, who is, who is it? Gregory Russo. Oh, yeah. Six. Yeah. Really interesting yeah. prospect. Um, looking forward to Hopefully he comes off the board in round two. He uh, will. We'll see. All right. Thanks Ryan, to Ryan Wilson again and to Jamie and to Ben Schrager and all of you for listening. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about the NFL veterans that have the most to gain and lose in the NFL draft. And go to our Facebook page and get in our draft contest and get in the podcast league. See ya.